Um, that was really wonderful. I, I wonder if you'd say a little bit about, you talked a little bit about the sacralization of landscape. And I wonder to what extent sort of the attachment that one might have to landscape has something to do with the effort that one puts into it. And is walking and being in it at least the first stages of putting some sweat into something? And does that give you a kind of possibly false sense of attachment and ownership. So not only you belong in a landscape, but you own the landscape. Huh. And I'm just reminded of this um, phrase by someone I don't normally particularly admire, but Baden Powell, who says, when you, when you stay somewhere, when you camp somewhere, make sure to leave two things only. Um, he says, leave thanks and leave nothing which is the opposite of a path in a way. It's sort of a light touch in something and don't leave something which will keep you attached to it and give you some sense of right over it. And is that sense of sacralization strongly linked to a sense of possession? Oh, well, there, uh, it's a very good and complicated question and there's a lot going on in it. Uh, the first thing to say is that I am interested in in landmarks that are uh, modest and um, collaborative, which is what paths are, because it's very hard to make one on your own, they tend to be um, repeated acts by groups of people, the children at the beginning of Thomas's poem. And in that sense, if they're owned, they are um, owned in a, in a sort of community or collaborative sense. Um, I, like, as I can tell from your, your tone, like you, I'm extremely wary of accounts of landscape which seem to invest ideas of possession in them because they very often are followed by ideas of exclusion. And chalk, oddly, is the English substance which has been most closely associated with English identity, the blazon of the white chalk cliffs, uh, uh, and with a certain kind of exclusive Englishness. The, uh, I mean, it, 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 is, it is the the Cretaceous is the origin of our South Country. It's the origin of what we see when we arrive. Um, Paths are made by moving, though. They, um, they, 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 they are mobile. They run like rivers, as Thomas said. So, in some sense, this is a whole book about movement rather than dwelling. And it is, it is more interested in, in migrancy than it is in living close. Thomas himself was torn between the two impulses. And I, I think that's what makes him so very modern. He, wa he loved to live in one place, but he couldn't. He always had to keep moving. And those two impulses, the root that delves down and the foot that moves on, they're what animate his poetry and eventually kind of tear him apart. So I, I share your caution about ideas that invest in stasis and therefore belonging and therefore exclusion. In a report that depression is not cured by walking, I don't know if you saw the, the I think it's in the British Medical Journal. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are we escaping depression by walking, or is it a curative? And second, did you get your bike back at the beginning of the <laughs> way when, when, where you'd stashed it? Uh, I got my bike back, the deal with the second one first. I got my bike back, so the, the good village folk of Linton are to be admired for their honesty. It was locked, mind you, but not to anything. Um, there was a report this week saying that depression is not cured by walking. There was a report a month ago that said depression is cured by walking. Um, there was a report six weeks ago which said Alzheimer's is cured by walking. Um, so it looks as though you saw that one yourself. Um, uh, so, uh, I am, I'm no uh, adjudicator of the competing truth claims of those reports. What I can do is, is give anecdotes in response to that. Thomas was not, I mean, I keep coming back to Thomas, as I said at the beginning, because he makes visible so many of these questions that interest so many of us. Um, he was not always cured by walking, by any means. It, it, he, he could outstride his depression, but the time when he nearly kills himself, he famously pockets a revolver storms out of the house, walks up onto Shoulder of Mutton Hill, which is above where he lives in the Hampshire Downs, leaves Helen behind, but basically says, I'm going to kill myself. And he clearly walks up to, to see if nature will persuade him otherwise. 
Nature doesn't do anything of the sort. Nature makes its disinterest in Edward Thomas very, very clear. Um, it's only because some, somebody sees him and he feels slightly shamefaced that he then kind of goes back to the house and he comes back in, he says, his feet muddy and covered in leaves and takes the revolver out and puts it down again. Poor Helen has been rocking back and forth in the, inter in the interim and they, they barely speak of it. I mean, there are many versions of this. But, so Thomas was not always cured. Nature is, is not our salve and it's not our, it's not our panacea. And sometimes it is precisely the fact of its disinterest that is bracing to us. I am not part of nature, Thomas kind of yowls in the middle of the Icknield Way, which this otherwise conventional travelogue suddenly thrust through with this threnody of grief at realising that he is not part of nature. So there's no answer. George Borrow outstrode his depression year after year by walking and walking, 19th century, the great 19th century wayfarer. But so some people outpace their black dog and others are dog by it. Thank you. In this world of urbanization, technology, and uh, dis disconnection from nature, do you think that there's a place for modern man um, to rekindle the Native American vision quest, spending time in nature? Uh, um, have you had experience of the Native American vision quest? Um, I've had experience of my own kind of quests in nature on my own for prolonged periods, yeah. Well, I have not had experience of the Native American vision quest. Um, I'm, w I don't know anything about it. What I do know is that it takes work. It takes work for individuals and it takes work for, I mean, I'm, I, I was brought up not in the Protestant faith, but in Protestant ceremonies. And work is still very strong in me as an ethic and as an idea. So perhaps this is my non-Protestant childhood speaking through. But, I, I'm wary of this phrase, reconnect. Um, you didn't use it, but you did use disconnection. Um, it implies that we can just plug ourselves back in, that there's a kind of technological fix to the difficulty in which we've landed ourselves, which can be adjusted by a simple um, change of current or connection. Um, actually, it takes uh, a lot more than that. I haven't achieved it, goodness me. I'm a suburbanite and, uh, uh, and a teacher and a, and a traveler and a flyer sometimes. Um, so I am interested in those, those kinds of work that might bring us closer to uh, an understanding of nature that might help us out of the difficulties that we already face and will surely face in, in, in greater urgency in the coming century. Whether that means vision quests uh, prescribed universally, I, I can't say. I, I guess uh, similar to that, but um given that there is a certain disconnect with nature now and that most people inhabit, not most people, most young people tend to inhabit virtual worlds which are created by other people, what's the end effect? Like, have, have, you, have you had some, some time to think about it and what's your opinion? Um, I don't know if that, if that was heard, but a general, a general experience of, di of disconnection, particularly among, uh, among young people, among children, um, uh, I, I'm not a policy maker, um, I just write and I'm interested in language and I'm interested in how language connects or fails to connect us to our places. Uh, it, I wrote a long essay about how in the most recent edition of the Junior Oxford English Dictionary the words heron, willow, blackberry with a small b um, and uh, uh, there was another extraordinary word, had been, had dropped out, had been excluded as an editorial decision. Um, the words interface, internet, um, uh, and, 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 and I can't, I can't there's, a, there's an extraordinary list of what had gone and what had come in. And whether, again, whether that is a reflection of what is now known, of a, of a, of a lexis that is available, um, and in use, or whether it's almost a prescription on the editorial front, I don't know. But I, I wrote a long essay about Gallic's, the precision of Gallic, and its extraordinary ability to name place into being, and the incredible density of toponyms that inhabit Gallic landscapes. So, um, Suleskir, the island, the Gannet Island that you saw, scrap of rock, it has 30 place names attached to it, and we named them off as we sailed. Around it. It's an extraordinary poetic language, but it's born out of a working relationship with place. Um, and I, so the National Park Authority is now, take, is now trying to create a glossary of, as it were, knowledge of intimacy for different landscapes in the UK. 
and see if, if, if we can encourage intimacy and connection through making language available to people. That's not really an answer to your question, but it's sort of a, sort of a response. I don't know whether you've seen that today um, has been announced the plans for the Olympic opening ceremony, um, which includes or is themed around a, a vision of the idyllic rural British countryside, um, which to me looks rather more like a Hornby model railway set, at least in the pictures. Um, but it seems a very strange collection of um, something rural in the middle of something urban. Um, something rural again in the middle of something, uh, or, or archaic in the middle of something very modern, and also um, it's in the middle of a sporting arena as well. And so I, I wonder what your kind of reaction to, to that was. I, well, I'm so glad you raised it. My, my knowledge of it is probably the same as yours, which is I saw it on the cover of Metro as I travelled here. Um, uh, I thought it was a joke to start with. Um, there's as exactly as you say, like a farmyard. It looks like a Playmobil or a Hornby mocker. I mean, I don't even understand what it is going to be. Is this going to be some video miniature? That I, I, have, I mean, is that actually going to be inside the stadium? Yeah. Uh, just extraordinary to me. <laughs> I, I, this is Danny Boyle. Yeah. This is the director of train spotting. <laughs> and he has created... I mean, I, I really I can't wait to look more at it because it is the most extraordinary condensation of rural dream in, uh, uh, as we wish to present ourselves to the country. It is, it is midsummer murders <laughs> as our shop window, but without any crime, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, it, it, boggles, it boggles the mind. And I, I, I would love to read an interview with Danny Boyle and see what that seditious... Fuck Scotland. That is the famous line when they go out, when Renton and Sick Boy go out walking with a bottle of vodka and try and climb a Scottish mountain. They sit there, they don't get very far. Seven days later, they're back on heroin. That's the, that's the sign-off from their adventure in the wilderness. And here he is serving up little England. Um, I found quite difficult to formulate this question, but it's something like, how much do you think that what we read about place influences our appreciation or reaction to it? Uh, I think it's a key question and a very difficult one to answer. Um, it's sort of easy to talk about how landscape shapes literature or language, but it's much harder to talk about how language shapes uh, landscape back or literature shapes landscape back. I mean, there are many examples in conservation history of activist literature sometimes counterfactual, like Cormac McCarthy's The Road, which was described by George Monbiot as the greatest environmental text ever written, changing the way we think about our responsibility to landscape. Um, John Muir, um, Edward Abbey, who's the monkey wrench gang, envisaged the eco-terrorist, eco-activist group Earth First before it even came into existence, and indeed came into existence almost out of his novels. I mean, there's an incredible feedback system between literature and the ways people behave ethically and politically towards their landscapes. Arguably Gilbert White, author of Natural History of Selborne, second best-selling book in, uh, in the Western tradition after the Bible. Uh, that's probably a false statistic, but anyway. Um, uh, uh, many, many millions sold. You know, he is one of the great environmentalists, a, a little rural um, uh, 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 reverend staring down at his Hampshire parish. Um, uh, in my own sense, this is the last thing I'll say, uh, my, my attitude to the English landscape has been transformed forever by a little book called The Peregrine by J.A. Baker, which um, I will never see not only Essex in which it is set, but all of England uh, the same way again. And that has shaped much that I've written and many of the ways I've uh, walked and travelled. Um, thank you for the question. <laughs>